For me, the last even remotely interesting horror movie to be released was, I think, A Quiet Place, which is by no means a classic, at least in my book, but it was a refreshing moment for many people because it wasn't just another monster movie. It was a new scenario that I certainly had never seen before. It was a new kind of game, if you will, with rules to be followed reminding us that great horror horror that works, and much like any film for that matter, is as much about rules, logic, and problem solving as it is about emotion. And I think this is why I really liked the first three seasons of The Walking Dead. What really locked me into them was the unique scenario it presented, the strategy of surviving in that world. I wasn't so much interested in the characters, which were often annoying to me, but the world itself, the loneliness, the existential questions, the new rules of a new reality, the conditions of finding safety, holding up in a prison, wondering what you can do in order to live the rest of your life in this world without it all crashing down at some unforeseeable instant. The less interesting the survival scenarios became, the more I lost interest in the show. I don't care so much if your problem is that you have a rival faction, I've seen that plenty of times. I care if your problem means that you can't have light at night, that you can't make a noise, can't get cornered in a room, etc. The more limited you are, the more interesting. And incidentally, the characters are only as interesting as the scenario they are in, and the rules they have to play by. The characters I did come to like, only stood out to me because of how they faced their situations. I liked Rick Grimes because he took responsibility, had leadership ability and down-to-earth technical knowledge about what to do and how to handle people in these situations. I liked Glenn because he took risks and responded to danger with a sense of humor and levity. In sports, athletes are admired and idolized if and only if they are able to overcome opponents according to a certain set of rules. We are inspired by their skills and talents, yes, but it's the rules that bring out their talents, and even the aspects of their personalities that endear them to us. Without the rules, without the game, they would be nothing. This year I've been going through the Friday the 13th films, and honestly, I find them to be pretty lame for this reason. They lack the game aspect. There is very little actual character development because there is very little fighting back. A lot of jump scares, a lot of tension in preparation for a surprise death, and a lot of running, but little strategy. The best thing about the films is the mythos they create. And speaking of which, has anyone made a video on how Friday the 13th is just the Nietzschean eternal recurrence of the film Psycho? If not, someone should make that video. Speaking of Psycho, what Alfred Hitchcock does in that film is incredibly brilliant, but so effortless that it might go overlooked. Of course, everyone does know that Psycho is genius because Hitchcock creates a compelling film narrative to begin with, surrounding a protagonist who, perhaps justifiably, steals some money and faces the problem of, how am I going to get away? Am I going to be able to go through with it? And Hitchcock then destroys that narrative in the middle of his film, and he is able to change it to a different narrative. Another narrative that is even more compelling, like Bach creating the genius of the musical offering, out of the theme given to him by Frederick the Great, Hitchcock created a greater narrative from the ashes of the first, using that raw material to make a better one. But what is that greater narrative? It's a new protagonist, Norman Bates, who is more interesting than the last protagonist only because he is placed in a more interesting problem and responds to that problem more interestingly. The problem is that he has a murderous mother, and he doesn't want her to kill people, but he also doesn't want her to get caught, so he has to compete both against her and against the people coming to investigate the missing person. So on the one hand, he has to fight the monster, but he also has to fight the good guys. His clumsy strategizing is what makes his character iconically endearing and ultimately horrifying. The twist at the end of the film wouldn't be nearly so powerful without this game that Hitchcock created. And man, if Friday the 13th had just copied Psycho a little bit more, 
I know it already copied Psycho a lot already, but if it just incorporated more of these themes, more of this game, and took itself more seriously instead of just copying the Halloween franchise, which I also find boring, man, what it could have been. As I've watched through these gimmicky slashers, I couldn't help but think of the film Alien, which you all know I love, and which feels like a slasher film in a lot of ways, except that it actually develops its characters, including the ones it kills off, which is well, most of them, but you actually care about them when they die. How does it do this? A lot of people will look directly to first act dialogue and banter. And they'll say we connect with those characters because of the way they interact with each other before the monster appears. And there's a lot to be said for that. There's a lot of good writing in that movie. But in reality, it's the problem, or I should say, the many problems they face and actively try to solve even before the alien appears that makes them more endearing even than their conversations. It's what makes the conversations themselves endearing. They have to deal with the problem of the facehugger. They face the dilemma of letting Kane back on the Nostromo, the drama surrounding Ash. And ultimately, it's the fact that they strategize to fight back against the Xenomorph that creates the characters even more. They have to become more clever and courageous, more ideal human beings, even if in the end they succumb. And it's the fact that it's not just the monster that hunts them, but that they hunt the monster, which makes them, and especially Ripley, iconic. The same theme of hunting the hunter is a key element in the success of classic works like Stoker's Dracula and even finds its way into Shelley's Frankenstein, though it's less pronounced there. The problems these novels create and the solutions they pose are what makes them classics. Horror stories, whether literary or cinematic, while they are generally defined as stories that are uniquely aimed at generating emotion, it seems to me that horror stories that work, that are interesting and enduring, don't just give us tragedy or emotions or adrenaline, but a problem to be solved, and usually at least one character who doesn't just escape the problem, but who does solve it. In the end, I believe the rules of good storytelling are the rules of life. And one of the inarguable truths of storytelling is that characters, like us, like real life, are only so great and so interesting as the problems they face and their response to them. Alfred Adler, of course, considered problem solving to be the key paradigm of life. He wrote, individual psychology asserts that there can be no other way of understanding a human being than by the study of the movements he makes for the solution of his life problems. And I honestly think it's kind of funny how Adler traces so much of people's weaknesses and psychological problems back to the fact that they were either spoiled or pampered as children, going so far as to claim that a whole host of issues, which YouTube would love to demonetize me for talking about, real problems which countless people suffer from, are all a result of a lack of social feeling that can almost always be traced back to pampering in childhood, or to an excessive craving for pampering and relief. And by my own experience, I think it's true that lives which are too easy or comfortable, whether as children or adults, not only make us weak and unable to cope, but they cause us mental suffering. It's only by experiencing painful things that pain becomes less painful, or at least more sufferable. It's only by facing our more complex problems instead of avoiding them, accepting hardship rather than the ease of pampering, that we become strong, healthy, interesting, meaningful, and important members of the world which we all want to be. It is impossible to form a right estimate of an individual without knowledge of the structure of his life problems and the task they impose upon him. His essential nature is revealed to us only by his attitude towards them and by what takes place within him as the result of that attitude. We have to find out whether he plays his part or hesitates, comes to a standstill, tries to evade his task, and seeks and invents excuses for this evasion. 
When, on the other hand, one turns and attacks one's problems, driven by conquest, to find a solution to them, he creates new and perhaps entirely original forms of life from the pressure of his inadequate existence. His games are always directed to a future goal and are signs of his self-creative energy that can by no means be explained by conditioned reflexes. He builds continually in the void of the future, driven by the urge of his necessity to overcome. In the end, we are homo ludens, creatures who play, who game, and we are all of us innately self-creative storytellers. Every action we perform sets in stone an unchangeable past, an eternal narrative. It creates a story and it is a real story. And you have the choice of making that story great or lame. And your character will only be so fine, so great, so compelling as the scenario you are in. The problems you face, seek out and overcome. There are true horrors and evils and pains in this world, such as baffle the mind, and silence the lips, but they exist for us. They are the necessary negative space to our positivity. They are meant to keep you from the terrible fate of being a dull person. They are the gift wrapping which hold a hidden, better version of what you are. Dang it. I forgot about The Lighthouse. The Lighthouse was the last good horror movie to be released. At least that I remember. I'm probably forgetting some other film, and there might be some other that I, I just don't know about, so feel free to leave me recommendations for recently released horror films that you think are great, as well as reasons for why you think it's a great film. So far I've got a list, but I'm always happy to add to that list. Anyhow, with that being said, thank you for watching. This was kind of a last minute video for me. I had originally planned a different, much bigger project for Halloween, but it got to be much, much bigger than I could handle. And so I started another project and that one got a bit too big. So I ended up just kind of scribbling this out in a day and then throwing it together into a video, haphazard and incomplete as it is. So if you have anything to add to it and you're the kind of person who gets a lot of satisfaction in sharing their opinions in comment sections on YouTube, then by all means critique, criticize, and uh, add to whatever I've said here. Or as always, you can just say hi. I usually try to read comments for at least the first week after I release a video and I, I need to go back and read more comments when I get a chance. Um, and for those of you who prefer to express your gratitude from the lurking darkness of the shadows, you can hit the like button if you want. Or if you're like me and you just watch YouTube videos without interacting at all, that's great, that's fine too, I'm glad you're watching. Thanks for watching all the way to the end. More videos are on their way and I will see you when the next one drops. Huh, The Haunting of Hill House was also released in 2018. That was pretty good. Too bad I don't give money to Netflix anymore. If you know, you know.